Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome to SJU. Dexter is back after kind of crap in its bed and its pants uh, in its original finale. Uh, it's getting a second chance. Does it deserve it? Are there other shows that deserve that second shot more? Uh, we're going to get into that. Plus, uh, stick around and we will be uh, answering your questions from the chat. And then we have a cool little uh, uh, nugget of a surprise uh, for you guys. Uh, a, a Star Trek Discovery cram it from our own uh, Riley Silverman. We'll be closing out the show with that. So stick around. We've got a lot of very cool things to talk about. With me to talk about those very cool things, Lon Harris, Spencer J. Gilbert. Hello, gents. Hey, hey. Hello. You guys ready to talk about some Dexter? I'm I'm in a kill room. How much more ready <laughs> could I possibly be? That is completely fair. Well, uh, uh, while you get comfortable in your kill room, I want to remind everybody, uh, our next Fandom 5 trivia show is about Star Wars. Uh, so come answer five questions correctly about Star Wars, uh, and you win real money. It's it's a great, fun game. There's a, a link in the description with more information uh, for how to RSVP and participate and come check that out. It's going to be a lot of fun. Make sure you're there. So, hey, guys, this is uh, this, this pun is via Ryan. Dex who back. I like it. This is a uh, uh, so Showtime has ordered a new limited series revival of Dexter. Yay! Uh, Michael C. Hall uh, is back along with the original showrunner Clyde Phillips. Um, the the premium cable network has handed the series a ten a ten part. Wow, sorry, reading this in real time. A ten parter uh, that is set to go into production in early 2021 with a tentative premiere date. Uh, in uh, fall 2021. So, where Dexter left off, just just to remind, just to set the the scene, and then we can get into the to our Dexing. Um, uh, there are no uh, details as to the whereabouts of Hall's Dexter in the reboot. Also, we're just going to be spoiling Dexter a lot. So if you if you're still catching up, click out of this and Stop. watch the Jiu-Jitsu trailer. He's in the woods. <laughs> He's Stop the- it. Stop at the end of season four and just pretend that there was no more Dexter. That's what I yeah. recommend. That's yeah. really where it wraps uh, up in a lot. meaningful way. Uh, so uh, the finale of uh, of season eight saw Dexter having faked his death and living under a new name in Oregon after wrecking his boat and escaping a hospital with the body of his sister who had been shot and left in a coma and having sent his son Harrison and love interest Hannah to live in Argentina. Or like Lon said, it stopped at season four. They, the, the, the crime of Dexter is that it had a beautiful, perfect finale. Season four's season finale is mwah. The, the end it. It's done. That's it. It comes full circle. Everything comes back around. It's like four great seasons of TV that wraps mm-hmm. up beautifully. And then it just lurches on for four more years. And they very clearly never figured out anywhere else to go. The last season's pretty strained and, and I mean you didn't even mention that the last shot of the show basically reveals that he is now a lumberjack as if one as care. if as if that's incompatible with serial killing like is that supposed to put a pin in the serial killing like well he couldn't be a serial killer anymore now he's a, a lumberjack like I don't he think of that as and so he cuts into trees yeah how is that how is that like a wrap-up kind of moment anyway it's just ridiculous uh So, yeah, I mean, I guess more makes sense in that you can sort of and it's going back to the original showrunner who did the good seasons. So I guess the idea is we can sort of make up for how disappointing the the conclusion was, like by bringing it back to the classic Dexter. I don't know. I guess that's good. Uh, Yeah. So wait, uh, just to to refresh me, because I I flushed so much Dexter out of my head. Season four is Trinity. Yeah. Yeah. Season four was John Lithgow, the Trinity killer. And then it, it, it concludes with, you know, Rita is is killed and he's left with their baby so now he's got this he's the single father with the the tormented baby that has been through this crazy trauma to raise and it like it's like this beautiful perfect circular moment yep. and and you know he's already trinity's already dead so it's like it's a real conclusion and it's it's very clear that they didn't know how to keep going and then they just kind of kept coming up with stuff that sort of half was figured out like Ivan Strahovski or that crazy season with Colin Hanks and Edward James Olmos. Now I've heard a rumor that Spencer loves the latter seasons of Dexter. Uh, (laughs) Spencer, what's wrong with you? You know, there's a lot 
to be said about them by somebody else because I did not watch the later seasons of Dexter. Uh, in fact, the last season I watched was the Lithgow season. If that was season four, it sounds like I got off at the right time. Oh, you did. That the season four finale should have been. <laughs> There literally was never another good thing after the. Fourth if season. I can, if I can sum it up uh, for you, uh, what's the actress's name that played his sister who uh, married Jennifer Carpenter? Je- uh, so uh, she played again. Played his sister. They were married in real life. Yeah. After they got divorced in real life, they did a season of her falling in love with her brother. After they got divorced, isn't and that it's, fun? Isn't that and fun? it's particularly That's upsetting. That's so twisted. Because they did, they did such a good job of establishing this very realistic brother sister relationship in the early seasons. Like they're both very good actors, and it was very convincing. And so then it takes this bizarre turn, and you're like, no, you've already sold me on them being brother and sister. You can't not, you can't undo that now. Is that how it works? Is Dexter? So look, you know, I, I can't, I can't speak for the world, you guys. Uh, is there enough? Interest, like collect, like a collected fandom outcry to to give Dexter a second shot, or did it take enough second shots and then uh, it it doesn't deserve any more? I don't think there's any interest. I mean, if Dexter's remembered for anything, it's for ending terribly. Um, yeah. So look, enough time has passed. If it's like, you know, it was on for six years, it's been more than six years since we've seen it. Maybe those feelings have faded, or but also the memory of Dexter has faded. Uh, I don't remember much except like John Lithgow uh, trying to be scary. Um, granted, early Lithgow was scary, but late stage Lithgow, no. No, Third Rock from the Sun Lithgow has never scared anybody. <laughs> I, I, don't, I mean, I think season four was, was pretty effective, but I also think this is a like... Shameless is ending. Ray Donovan is ending or over. Billions is wrapping up. But I mean, like Showtime, had, they don't have up and coming series that are taking the place of those very popular series. We're also now entering a phase where there's just going to be it's a smaller and smaller pie that all these premium cable networks are individually right. slicing up for one another. At some point, Showtime will probably get like hoovered into the rest of the Viacom CBS family. I think they just need marketable content that's in recognizable brand names. And they're probably looking forward at this having a long streaming life and more seasons of Dexter are going to be more valuable to them than new seasons of some other random show, like on becoming a God in central Florida, which was great, but which didn't build up a brand name in one season as significant as Dexter. Yeah. Well, so we see this happen a lot, right, guys? Like, um, it, on the big screen and the small screen, you know, Halloween uh, got its continuation that ignored a huge chunk of uh, of the franchise. You know, even when Roseanne came back, they ignored, you know, that last one or two seasons where it was all stuff she made up for a book and right. blah, 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 and it got real weird. So even, you know, that revival, like, ignored... Uh, it's she chunk. won the lottery, Joe. <laughs> Get it right, please. All right, sorry. Uh, I remember a book. Am I making that up? I no, don't... no, that's how they explained it later. But in the show, she won. Roseanne <laughs> Connor is. won <laughs> the lottery. Yeah. yeah, more Roseanne on this show. Yeah, uh, that's what we need. Um, You're already wearing your Pizzagate hat. Might as well just go full <laughs> Roseanne. <laughs> oh, this whole thing is just something. That's <laughs> um, are there any? shows uh or hell even even movie franchises that you guys do wish like could get that second shot like uh sure but i mean it generally doesn't work well i mean and and also like the the uh, for whatever reason and i'm grateful uh like ip doesn't seem to hold as much sway on television as it does in movies like the lethal weapon show and like when they try to take brand names and make them into uh into series it usually flops for uh, uh, for better or worse and kind of makes room for more original things. But yeah, I'm sure we've all got a, like a laundry list of old t- canceled TV shows we love to bring back. Um, I want to see more uh, uh, Insomniac with Dave Attell. I was just thinking about <laughs> how has that not been going for a hundred years? I mean, just get a drunk stand-up to wander around from between <laughs> the hours after the stand-up show to the morning. Like, what? It's gold, Jerry. I, I don't understand why that show hasn't still been going on. Ironically, I think that also ended with him talking with and becoming a lumberjack. A lumberjack. Yeah. 
So tell me about cutting down all these trees, man. <laughs> Whoa! God, that show was good. I love that that's the first place that you went. Like, <laughs> to the, the 15-year-old Comedy Central Dave Attell docuseries where he hangs out with guys who uh, make ice cream treats at 4 a.m. Uh, yeah, I would love to see more Insomniac with Dave Attell. At post-COVID. I don't want to put him out there right now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah post COVID. Uh, I mean, number one, and I know a lot of the internet is already annoyingly yelling about this, so it's not just me, but Hannibal, guys, Hannibal. I desperately want them to bring back Hannibal. They were on the verge of doing Signs of the Lambs, but even if they can't get the rights to Clarice Starling and her story, there's so much more cool stuff you could do with those characters in that world. Gone yeah. too soon, for sure. Also, uh, we never got, I always felt like lost. We got sort of tantalized at the end with there were all these years when like Ben Linus and Hurley were like in charge of the island and like them sort of managing everything. And we never really got a glimpse of that era. That would be a fun spinoff. I would watch two or three seasons of here's I know what was Lost, going on in the island when Ben and Hurley were in charge. I know Lost hits a lot of these lists of like uh, disappointing TV finales. It usually is, is on them because it was too yeah. ambiguous. I, I mean, I, I I get that about, like, I think the final Lost season is a little bit of a letdown because it kind of does this, like, they don't want to delve into some of the big mysteries from early seasons. It's already kind of moved on. So they do this kind of sleight of hand, like, oh, look, Sideways Universe. What's going on on there? Let's go check it out, guys. Forget about this stuff. Let's go. What's up? What's over here in the Sideways Universe? Uh, but actually, the finale as an episode, I think, is pretty good. Like, I really, I like how it all kind of wraps up. It's just that. They kind of pulled that final season sleight of hand, which is, yeah. it's a little annoying. Well, uh, May Caber in chat agrees with you. She says, I think a lot of people would be into a Hannibal return. Oh my God, it'd be um, so good. Uh, at Chid, uh, mentioned a few. Uh, he said, uh, American Vandal, he'd love to see return. <laughs> uh, and obviously, and I agree with that. There are a lot of good shows that just don't continue. Well, yeah, Netflix is bad. Like in the streaming era, they cut off a lot of shows like way before they've, you know, like networks would usually, if you get back for season two or three, they'll let you sort of run through your good right. ideas. And Netflix is like, no, you're done after three, even if it's yeah. great and still going strong. And then, but then, you know, there's stuff. Uh, he also, uh, uh, Chit also included uh, Sense8 on their list. And um, sure. you know, Sense8, Sense8 was great. It, I feel like it got a chance to, to wrap up. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I liked it. That There's just, that's like, a very soft spot for a lot of people. Like a lot of every time Netflix tweets, like still you get like, bring sense back. I think it was just, it was also so ambitious that it feels mm -hmm. like you want to see the creators get to finish that vision. You know, it's like this huge idea. Um, so I feel like people are frustrated that they didn't get to see it all play out. You know, is there anything that just like went off the rails that you'd love, you know, like, like Dexter's getting this, this opportunity to to right the wrongs oh. and de lumber the jacks. I don't I don't know. <laughs> um, are there any shows like that? that you I know? I've got one. Unless Spencer, you've got. I mean, something. Game of Thrones is is an easy yeah. pick right there. Uh, yeah. Give that to that. somebody else for the last two and a half seasons. Um, I would love 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 to get some uh, to get the cast back together and to get uh, some people who were. Maybe uh, less uh, they had both their feet in the door instead of one foot out of the door and could uh, take another swing at adapting uh, uh, the books. Maybe when Winds of Winter comes out in 2027, <laughs> we could get uh, some new seasons uh, or some some remastered remix seasons uh, How about from somebody else. Three seasons to redo the last two. Of yes, the HBO perfect. Show right, perfect. like like because yeah. it expanded a little. Uh, the one other one I would say, and I still like the show. Listen, I'm not down on it, but I would love to see somebody try to retackle the end of Battlestar Galactica, like right. starting starting from the all along the Watchtower yes. episode <laughs> on, and just yeah. like rethink giving away so many Cylon secrets right away. Like I would just love to see another creative team take a crack at that because. It's still good, but it was so good up till there, and then yeah. it kind of drifts off a little. Bit. Agreed. Yeah, um, I was, uh, you know, uh, I think True Blood is an example of, you know, I think along with Dexter, uh, you just need to know when to fold them. Like season four, Dexter, great high note, 
end the show. Like, I know it's tough when everybody's watching your thing and blah, 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 but, like, just know when a good thing's over. And I feel like True Blood, the first season, second season, they all start to meld together, but eventually it starts to collapse under its own world. All the, uh, She's a fairy, and I think there's a Frankenstein, and, you know, uh, and it, it just gets... It just collapses like so a good. dying so good. <laughs> It just collapses like a dying star at some point. And that's another one where um if you could do like a like a six episode mini that just wraps up like the first two seasons of like really solid like vampire storytelling from True Blood, I think that 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 that's one that maybe deserves it. It's a, it's a very talented cast and, you know, all that good stuff. Um, and then, uh, hmm, I'm trying to think of any other shows. Uh, I would tighten uh, uh, most of the Defender shows. Um, There's always, like, that would be so much better if they were 8 to 10 episodes instead of, like, yeah. 12 to 14. I think every season of every one of those shows would be improved by going to 10 from 13. It's just 13 is just they don't have the budget, they didn't have this, you know, like, it was just too much, too much story for one season of these shows. Yeah. Uh, yeah, maybe maybe a movie to, like, give them a final bow. I mean, I, I, I still think Charlie Clock, Char, Charlie, Charlie Cox, uh, <laughs> Charlie Cox is gonna show up, uh, as Daredevil in the MCU proper. I still think it'll happen. It's just such an easy win for Disney to, to make that call. Um, but yeah, I, I, can, I can see that one coming back. I, I would also, uh, there was, as long as we're just going to gonna pluck stuff <laughs> from that, uh, there was a great show that was on Stars, so nobody saw it, called Counterpoint with J.K. Simmons, like a sci-fi thing from a few years ago about... Like there were a parallel, it's like a spy show, but set in a world where there were two parallel universes and like the J.K. Simmons from each universe met each other and they would like run missions in each other's universes. And it was so cool that if only people had seen it because it was on a real network that people had, uh, I think it would have been huge. And I'd love to see that just like bring J.K. Simmons back, bring the original creators, but just do it for Netflix or Amazon or something so it can actually get out there. That sounds cool. Uh, people can discover it. Uh, I remember seeing uh, billboards and saying, I don't know what that's about. I'm not going to watch it. But Lon, it was you told like me. in the 60s at the height of the Cold War in Berlin, there were a bunch of scientists doing experiments and they accidentally opened up a portal to like a mirror universe. And mm -hmm. when they first opened the portal in the 60s, the two universes were exactly identical. It just created like a duplicate. But ever since then, because people keep doing different things, like they keep diverging. So now it's like a really different version of our world over there. And we like only a few people in each world know about it. But of course, we do spy stuff on one another because we're horrible. And so there were always like sending covert agents back and forth to each universe to like mess with them. And their universe is convinced that they had this like, I didn't even think about this. There's like a pandemic storyline, like not our world, but the other world had this huge pandemic and they think we did it to them. So it's like there's all this rivalry uh, now. Yeah, it's cool. Alternate Joe coming over here and coughing on people. Yeah, um, exactly. Well, yeah, exactly. That might get a second life on HBO Max as they start culling stars programming. Yeah, oh, I mean, it's it's and it it like it left off in this place where there's I mean, there's so much because it's like the sci fi show and this spy show and you get the drama of like J.K. Simmons is all like nerdy in one universe and like a badass spy in another universe. And there's like all this stuff to explore. They could have gone like eight seasons with it. So we've got um, uh, there's a bunch of continuation shows that are already coming out. There's like the Say by the Bell uh thing fresh prince uh fuller house just finished have dark and gritty fresh prince dark and gritty fresh prince baby uh are you excited about any of those like can they can they are are they gonna work uh no for me um <laughs> yeah i think that even as i was watching saved by the bell as a child i knew that this wasn't good right. and uh same with full house and seeing fuller house only confirmed that it was trash. And yet, like, if you enjoy trash, they're giving you more of the trash you liked. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I like trash. Sometimes there's some delicious things buried in the trash. <laughs> but they're trash shows and they look like trash and they are trash. So uh, I guess there's still a, a healthy appetite for it. But um, I, c I couldn't say I'm excited. I mean, the Fresh Prince one 
it seems a little gimmicky uh, um, to just do uh, the the dark and gritty version of uh, what was a, a sitcom. Like people people flock to like the very special episodes, but by and large, like that was just a goofy sitcom. Yeah. It does um, seem like a, an oops, all very special episodes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fresh Prince. So, I mean, that could be, that's the most interesting because it could be different. It, they could use Fresh Prince just as a springboard to do like a, a different type of show. So, fine. I'll say I'm, I'm tepidly excited for that one. But God, stop bringing sitcoms back, man. Yeah. Yeah. What? I mean, there, I, I do think Fresh Prince is like, the, you, there's no, nis- that's not such a dumb sitcom premise that it has to be funny. Like, I think that the, uh, at its core, like that fish out of water kind of story, like you could do a dramatic version. I actually thought that that short that the guy did that got them to make the show was, was pretty good. So I can see that. Also, are we counting Animaniacs? Because I am excited for new Animaniacs. I am excited about I'm Animaniacs. Really, and they're that, bringing that one back. That Jurassic Park short made me Yeah, it's just like that feels like it could work today. It's just Looney Tunes jokes with today pop culture instead of 90s pop culture why not yeah i'm into but it. even in the 90s there were their pop culture was like 50s pop culture so yeah. i guess today's animaniacs would be talking about the, the 70s yeah yeah spielberg yeah. like de palma jokes yeah, spielberg right, fair enough. <laughs> as long as they have weird prince uh uh fingering jokes uh hidden away <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, uh i mean i was saying we had a question about uh is the sitcom dead uh, yesterday, uh, I made it sound much more dark than the question actually was. Is the sitcom dead? Um, and Saved by the Bell was what I was thinking about because it's very much just an old product of its time and trying to revitalize it for a new audience the way that trailer looks as though they have done, like, just looked terrible. <laughs> like, yeah, I do. So Part of me. Part of me has to feel like they're kind of doing the Brady Bunch movie bit with it, that it's going because they got the Zach Morris's trash guys working on the writing. And like, I don't even see how you do that show without more self-awareness. So I have to feel like that's maybe not in the marketing yet. Although they have there was that one teaser where Elizabeth Berkeley like references the. The, the diet pill, I'm so excited, I'm so scared bit that's like the internet's favorite. So yeah, yeah I have to feel like there's going to be a meta angle where it's like knows that we're laughing at Saved by the Bell and not with Saved by the Bell. Because yeah, you can't, like doing the full house, fuller house thing where it's just like, let's just remake it as the same show today is like, that's definitely not going to work, right? Like there's no way that would work. Right? Are you excited about... About uh, Saved by the Bell. I said it was trash once, and I'll say it's trash again, Joe. Um, but, this, but this is all new. Uh, no. You're commenting on the trash. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like it. You can't make me watch it. <laughs> I don't care that it has the name of a thing that I didn't like in the first place. I'm sorry. What about New Gossip Girl, Spence? Are you excited for New Gossip Girl? Yes. Give me all the hot one. goss. They're doing that one too, right? Yeah. Give me that goss. Uh, and, uh, give us a like and subscribe. Hey, uh, thank you guys for watching. Uh, we appreciate it a bunch. Uh, and in addition to, again, Phantom 5, uh, Star Wars, link in the description, click it. Uh, make sure you guys check that out. Win some real money. Uh, another thing I really wanted to plug today was, uh, hey, Lon Harris. Hey, that's me. Aren't you doing a, a, a podcast with 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 a with a with a pal with a with a family pal? I am my old uh, Owl Nation partner, as you recall from movie fights. Hal Rudnick and I. Uh, he will not. He still will not stop talking about Owl Nation, even on this podcast. Comes up like four times an episode. Uh, we're doing a show about streaming TV called Binge Boys. It's a lot of uh, you know we do some news. We do a lot of like here's all of the random stuff we watched on every streaming service this week. A little bit of a little bit of comedy as well, uh, and that's you can find it right now. It's on the Starburns Audio Network, home of many fine comedy podcasts. Uh, and you can find it now on all the major services: iTunes, your Spotify's, your Stitchers, maybe some others. Your your Google playlists. I don't know all those all those fine podcast networks. Guys, make sure make sure you check uh, check that out. Give it a subscribe. Give it a rating. Uh, give it a review. All of the things. All you- those things. Yeah. For podcasts, uh, go get uh, a little more Lon and Hal Rudnick uh, in your lives. It's a good podcast.
Yeah, it's, we're having fun. We're, we're goofing around. We're still you know. talking about them, the mouse, so uh, I'm pretty excited about you that. You guys never invited me on here to talk about Monsterland, so I had to do it somewhere. It was like this podcast. Hey, hey. Oh, is that the Hulu thing? That's the Hulu anthology, like... I- it's not really horror, but every once in a while a monster will show up just so we can <laughs> say it's horror and put it out in Look, October. It's, it's very well made, but we also wanted it to be about monsters. <laughs> uh, yeah, like 40 minutes into the monster show when you're like, is there, is, there, is there a monster in this? Like it should be, maybe be a little bit more about. I just, the monster I was like, inside you all along. Yeah, yeah, every it, episode is you. It's a the- little that. It's a little like if you don't spend any time serving the horror story, if it's just the character and then you like throw in a little dash of monster, it all kind of just feels like, well, the monster's just a metaphor. This is not really a story about a monster. Yeah. Like it, clearly you're very, just using it's, the monster is like rage. And look, it's <laughs> very well done. Uh, and I, the first, I think we watched the first three. Uh, yeah, those are that's what that's what I watched. And, and if I hadn't walked into them going, "Ooh, monster show," I might I might enjoy them. But if you're if it's 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 Halloween, baby, and if you're looking for spooky stuff, that might that might not be it. I don't know. No, um, no, it's it's a little bit more like for some people, a lack of education is their monster. For others, <laughs> a bully is their monster. You know, it's just like I just I, the actual monsters next time. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and uh, all of them, uh, also feel like they end, uh, with, uh, Mad World, the acoustic version of Mad World. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, going oh God. At the end of all of them. A little, little tinkly piano as we back away. Yeah, yeah a little bit. More. <laughs> all around me are familiar moments. This, that second, I, I like the first and the third one a lot more. The second one where it's like this guy sees like a shadow monster in his house. And so his reaction is to join like an alt-right online hate group. Like he becomes a proud boy. It's a little thin. But we don't know it's the proud boys until the connection the- between the two storylines of that one. It's a little thin. I don't yeah. know. going to work on that. Boys the real monster. Yeah. Um, right. Surprise, surprise. The proud yeah. boys are the real uh, monsters. Uh, uh, you guys want to, want to, want to, want to talk to chat? Let's do it. Uh, Benzatine asks, uh, huh, this, this is a, this is a good question. Did you guys <laughs> use this time stuck at home for home improvements? Did you clear out your closets? Did you tidy up the garage? Repaint your hallway? <laughs> get rid of all the spiders? What'd you do? Well, the spiders are our allies, you know, they, they keep the, uh, the mosquitoes and other bugs away. Um, mm-hmm. we have like a sliver of a patio. It's probably like five, four feet by six feet, something like that. Uh, and we always said one day we'd put a chair on it uh, and we did <laughs> 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 because, you know, you gotta, you gotta use every available piece of space you have in your home. Now that's like a whole new room is we put, uh, we put a little love seat out on the patio. Uh, that was our big, big home improvement. Otherwise... No, <laughs> uh, I live in a small Los Angeles apartment, so you're seeing like 70 percent of my home behind me right now. And so you tell me, has it changed? I don't know, America. Uh, I have not. I, I, I will say I have one bookcase that used to have like DVDs and old books and I cleared it out and I donated a bunch of that stuff and I got rid of the bookcase. So now I have a little bit more space to move around. That has been my big home improvement since uh, quarantine started. We had to, uh, I mean, because of the uh, got to work from home now, like we had to do practical changes. Like we had to turn, uh, uh, we had to do some adjustments. But my wife's an artist, so she has her own studio. But then some of her work had her in the living room during part of the day. And we had to sort of uh, uh, change some things up so that now she's just in there. And I'm just in here doing doing this stuff. This is very exciting content for everyone watching at home. Hey, ass man, so it's not on us. Uh, and uh, and we 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 painted a hallway. So my, we've been busy. All right. And by me, I mean her because she's talented and good at things, and I'm this. Um, <laughs> you have so, a pizza on your head. <laughs> yeah, I have a pizza on my head. I drove her to the Home Depot to buy the paint, and then she politely asked me to not help. Um, <laughs> that's that's where we were at. Um, us to me, uh, us to me, Eduardo uh, says, which sitcom with a live audience do you think benefited the most from having a live audience? I always think about Married with Children because the audience reactions added a lot more. Oh, yeah. Well, they were a boisterous audience and it was more than just laughing. You'd get a lot of like, ooh, and ooh. uh-oh, and like that uh, kind of stuff. Yeah, that, that was great. Yeah. And talk about a show that like, look, I don't want to give them any ideas, but uh, t- like a better version of... Um, 
God, what's that Tim Allen thing? Like Last Man Standing? Last Man just Standing, be to, yeah. Just be bring Married with Children back. My God. Which just got canceled. You guys see Fox just yeah. the plug after nine seasons. Um, I think that there would be a enormous hooting, hooves clapping audience for the like the non-PC <laughs> return of Al Bundy, baby. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, oh, right. But yeah, that that show was would be huge. I, th- I was thinking Arsenio Hall, but that's not a sitcom. Um, but yeah, but you got well, actually let, and hollering. Uh, who uh, who's your new Al Bundy? Because I think that's oh, great... it's still him. It's still, it's still uh, him. Ed O'Neill it's, for sure. It's still... <laughs> a thousand it's like percent. His, after Modern Family, it's like he's got a third new family now, and it's more <laughs> Bundy esque. Uh, yeah, and I think I he just I... picked right back up. Like he's just still in that chair, um, still a shoe yeah. salesman. I uh, I do. Uh, I also think I would throw Cheers on the pile here just because that kind of it, it, like not only is Cheers the bar where everybody knows your name, but the audience like every time a new character would come in, it was like a, the return of a familiar face. And it was like a very like everybody was happy to see Norm show up, not only the people in the bar, but the audience watching as well would give him like a greeting. And, uh, it was kind of kind of nice. I'm yeah. going to say that friends benefited the most because without the live audience being told when to laugh, no one would. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> I've converted you. And I would say a oh Seinfeld. Oh my God. <laughs> uh, Seinfeld was interesting where it was like the audience almost got in the way after a certain point. Like when the show really took off, you can see in like seasons five and and onward, like when Kramer enters the room, there's like a 30 second like scream break. Yeah. It's just like, oh, it's <laughs> Kramer. Finally. <laughs> yeah. uh, and for, for those that uh, don't just um, uh, for a little peek behind the camera, uh, sitcom live audiences are so controlled and directed. Like there are people going and, and really it, it feels like it very much feels like uh, an evangelical church back home where an usher walks around to make sure that everyone has their eyes closed and are in the spirit properly. Uh, to make sure you laugh at the right times, to make sure you're laughing a lot, to make sure you're going, hey, when Kramer slides in and, and all that good stuff. Uh, definitely hard directed uh, uh, situation. Yeah. Probably there's the also, most thankless, a- saddest job in entertainment is the the, the warm up comic warm-up who has guy. to right. instruct yeah. the sitcom audience on when to uh, laugh and keep them interested in uh, a process that's like four to six hours long to watch yeah. them make 22 minutes of television. Quick, yeah, quick behind the scenes, I went to go see, as a kid, my mom knew one of the producers on Roseanne, and so we went to go see a taping of Roseanne, and the warm-up guy in that era for the sitcom Roseanne was Tom Arnold. Oh, wow. And he was very inappropriate. <laughs> there, there were there were children watching because Roseanne was popular among families. Yeah. Tom Arnold just went right ahead with whatever he wanted to say, regardless of who was <laughs> listening. It was a very eye-opening experience for a 12, 13-year-old me. So, uh, uh, Kayla wants us to go positive, uh, all these bad endings, but are there any shows that have had perfect or satisfying, uh, <laughs> that's a big range, perfect to satisfying, mm. uh, uh, series finales? I mean, I like Friday Night Lights a lot. Um, I think that when he, he moves to Philly and it's, I think it's Philly and he's like the clear eyes, full hearts thing. Ah, you'll get it later. Uh, it's, it's great. It's a great uh, ending for Coach Taylor and and for that show in general. I remember being very satisfied by uh, by the end of that show, except for Matt Saracen becoming like a weird artist in Chicago. I, that doesn't track for me, but we'll we'll, we'll get into that on our uh, Friday Night Lights podcast. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think two good recent examples are The Americans had a really great final season and finale, and uh, Breaking Bad. I thought the Breaking Bad finale was. Sure. That whole, again, the whole last season of Breaking Bad, Ozymandias, which is not the actual last episode, is the one that I think people really remember as kind of the big send off. But Felina, the, the actual Breaking Bad finale is pretty great as well. Very satisfying. I thought. The finale of The Office, they managed to like after some uneven oh, late yeah. seasons, do a great uh, wrap up at the very end. Yeah. And the do. original UK office, that that final Christmas special is also yeah. good. I think the final Christmas special of the BBC office is great, but even if you didn't have that, just the dark, sad ending of season two, where um, uh, uh, David Brent <laughs> quotes Dolly Parton. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, he, and then he's just like, and they say she's just a pair of tits. <laughs> and the credit the end. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> is, is, is also a really great ending. Um, hey, I think we're there, guys. I uh, uh, want to leave you guys with a uh, 
a, a, a cool little uh, cool little something. Uh, I am not the biggest Trekkie in the world, but we have a lot of uh, uh, channel friends and family, Hector, Riley, that really are into uh, Star Trek Discovery. Uh, so Riley put together this cram. It. They're premiering uh, the show premieres tonight, season uh, three, I believe. Premieres tonight. Uh, so if you want to check it out, if you're interested, but you also don't want to spend today uh, uh, double timing uh, through the first two seasons, uh, our own Riley Silverman uh, created this cram it for you guys. Uh, it's streaming now on CBS All Access. Uh, the return of the critically acclaimed series Star Trek Discovery, the crew of the USS Discovery, lands in an unknown future. Now they will work together to restore hope to this new world. The new season of Star Trek Discovery uh, now streaming on CBS All Access. And uh, Riley now takes it away with all of the things that build up to what I just said. Thanks for watching, guys. Star Trek Discovery marked the long-awaited return of one of the most beloved science fiction institutions to the small screen. With the third season of the streaming show coming soon, here's everything you need to know about where Disco has gone before. In Season 1, we first meet Michael when she's serving as commander on board the USS Shenzo under the captaincy of Philippa Giorgio. While the Shenzo is investigating a damaged satellite, Michael stumbles across an ancient Klingon vessel and also a pretty angry Klingon who Michael accidentally kills. Whoops. The Klingons, led by a zealot named Takuvma, vow to destroy the Federation, who they see as assimilationist conquerors. We learn that Michael is the adopted daughter of Vulcan Ambassador Sarek, having lost her own parents in a Klingon raid as a child. This also makes her the adopted sister of Spock, which might be relevant later. Anyway, back to the Klingons, Sarek tells her the Vulcans earn the respect of the Klingons by firing on them first which Michael attempts to do against the captain's orders, fails, and is thrown into the brig for mutiny. Meanwhile, reinforcements arrive for both sides of the conflict. Michael and Giorgio attempt to capture Takuvma, but the Klingon leader and the captain are both killed in the process. Vok, a Klingon outcast, assumes command of Takuvma's followers. Burnham is given a life sentence due to her mutiny. All in all, not a good day for Michael Burnham. Six months later, Michael is on a prison transfer shuttle that is rescued after an emergency by the USS Discovery, where she makes friends with her new roommate Tilly, a naive Starfleet ensign notable for dropping the first F-bomb in Star Trek history. Guys, this is so f***ing cool. Michael is also reunited with First Officer Saru, who she served with on the Shenzo, as well as a few other former crewmates of hers that are a tiny bit pure at that whole war she started thing. While on the Discovery, Burnham is ordered by its captain Gabriel Lorca to assist in scientific work on the ship while she's there. Lorca prefers to work in dim lighting, citing an injury that affected his eyes. Huh. Anyway, Michael begins to uncover evidence of secret experiments on board the Discovery, spearheaded by Lieutenant Paul Stamets. After a similar experiment kills the crew of Discovery's sister ship, the USS Glenn, Lorca reveals to Michael that he orchestrated her arrival on his ship and feels that free thinkers like her would help him win the war, and reveals the ship is working on a new spore-based propulsion system. He also has a mysterious creature from the Glen secretly transported to the Discovery. That creature, revealed to be a giant tardigrade, has a natural connection with the spores and is the key to unlocking an advanced form of jump-based travel. Back with the Klingons, Vok loses command of Takuma's followers to the charismatic Cole, who leaves him to die. Laurel, another Klingon, swears secret loyalty to Vok and promises to restore his leadership. Lorca is taken captive by the Klingons and is tortured by Laurel alongside another Starfleet officer, Ash Tyler, and a criminal named Harry Mudd. In prison, Mudd tells Tyler that Lorca was the only survivor when his previous ship was attacked by Klingons. I didn't let my crew die. I blew them up. Lorca reveals that he destroyed his own ship, feeling he was giving his crew a quick death versus a slow and painful one at the hands of the Klingons. Tyler and Lorca hatch an escape plan, leaving Mud behind. Mud swears revenge. You haven't seen the last of Harcourt sent in Mud! On the Discovery, Burnham grows concerned that overuse of the spore drive is killing the Tardigrade, whose name is Ripper, by the way. Isn't that cute? Anyway, Stamets infuses his own DNA with Ripper's, which allows him to become a human flight computer, but... Well, there are side effects. There are several episodes dealing with the events of the war, but since we don't have all day, Mud tries to get his revenge on the heist involving a lot of time loops, 
Sarek's ship gets destroyed, causing Michael to delve deeper into some major unresolved issues from their past. Starfleet Admiral Cornwell suspects that Lorca isn't fit to lead, but before she can do anything about it, she goes and gets kidnapped by the Klingons, only to be aided in her escape by Laurel, who says she wants to defect, but causes a PTSD-like triggering of shock to Tyler due to the abuses he suffered at her hands. During their rescue, Lorca makes Stamets jump the ship 133 times in order to utilize an algorithm that'll help in the detection of cloaked Klingon ships. Stamets, feeling ill effects from the spore drive, tells Lorca he'll only jump the ship one last time, seemingly to safety, but actually to a strange, mysterious location. The crew discovers they've entered into a parallel universe, a mirror universe, if you will, where the Federation doesn't exist and the galaxy is instead ruled by a Terran Empire, with resistance from an alliance of Klingons, Vulcans, and hey look, Samandorians! They learn in this universe, Mira Michael was the captain of the Shinzo before she was resumed killed by Mira Lorca. Mira Tilly is captain of Discovery and kind of a badass about it. Burnham takes Lorca to the Mira Shinzo where she assumes command and he assumes being tortured. There's a lot of intrigue and adventure that happens in the Mirror Universe, but there's a few especially big reveals, and for the sake of time, let's just get right to them. First off, Tyler discovers that he's undergone some extensive physical alterations, causing him to lash out and kill Discovery's Dr. Culber. And after a meeting with Mirror Vogue, the leader of the Rebellion, Tyler realizes that he was never Ash Tyler at all, but is actually a disguised sleeper agent Vogue. Second, Burnham learns that the Terran Emperor is none other than Mira Giorgio, who had raised Mira Burnham as a daughter only to be betrayed by her. But speaking of betrayals, while Mira Giorgio is probing Michael for information on her universe, Michael realizes that Captain Lorca has been Mira Lorca this entire time, and he has been manipulating events in an effort to get back to the Mira universe. Never trust Jason Isaacs, people! It always burns you! Lorca is killed in an attempt, alongside Mira Stamets, to seize the throne of the Mira universe, and the Discovery crew, along with Mira Giorgio, use the Spore Drive's mycelial network to return to their own universe. The ship arrives nine months later to find the Klingons have nearly won the war. Admiral Cornwell and Sarek explain that the divided Klingon houses have made it a contest amongst themselves to destroy as much of the Federation stuff as they can, and Starfleet is withdrawing to try to fortify Earth. Meanwhile, Giorgio says that she defeated the Klingons in her universe via a surprise attack on their homeworld, Kronos. Cornwell has her pose as the late Captain Giorgio to lead such a mission. Upon realizing that the completed plan would result in the annihilation of all life on Kronos via a series of volcanic eruptions, Michael questions the mission, insisting that even at its most desperate, Starfleet must not commit genocide. She convinces Giorgio to give her the detonator, which she then gives to Lorel, who uses a threat of annihilation to unite the Klingon factions under her new leadership, effectively ending the war. Ash Tyler, who has undergone an operation to stabilize his personality in Vogue's body, chooses to stay with Lorel. Michael is pardoned for her mutiny and restored to the rank of commander. Discovery's crew is commended for their heroics. As the ship heads to Vulcan to pick up their new captain at the end of Season 1, they receive a distress call from another starship, the USS Enterprise. Season 2 picks up immediately where the first left off, and while it is in many ways significantly more complicated than Season 1, it's actually easier to recap by breaking it down by some of its core elements. While there are several interesting subplots involving Tilly being infected by a life form from the Mycelia Network, and the once murdered Doc Culber being brought back to life from said Mycelia Network, the season's major plot revolves around a mysterious set of seven red signals that appear throughout the galaxy. After the Discovery responds to the Enterprise's distress call, they learn from Captain Christopher Pike that after the Enterprise detected the red signals, the ship underwent a total systems failure that left it stranded. Much of the season then follows as something of a chase quest, with Discovery seeking out the various signals and trying to determine their cause. Simultaneously, Michael begins seeking out her brother Spock, who has taken a mysterious leave of absence and, Michael discovers, has also been investigating the signals. The signals frequently lead Discovery to a crisis in need of their intervention, including a wrecked ship from the Klingon War, the USS Hiawatha, as well as New Eden, a colony of pre-warp humans saved from Earth's World War III, they take them to Saru's homeworld, where they upend the subjugation of his people under a rival race, the Ba'ul, and to an ancient dying sphere containing vast amounts of information from its time in the universe. Most of these events are tied to a mysterious Red Angel, a figure that Michael encounters that seems to be connected to all the signals. The figure also ties into Michael's search for Spock, who drew images of the Red Angel as a child. 
Ash, Tyler, and Lorel have had a child together, but its safety is threatened by rivals to Lorel's command over the Klingons. With the help of Mir Giorgio, the death of Tyler and the baby are faked, which allows Lorel to consolidate her power. Giorgio recruits Tyler into Starfleet's clandestine operations, Section 31, and the baby is taken to be raised in the Klingon Monastery, which studies time crystals. This plotline converges with Michael's when Section 31 begins their own investigation into Spock, who has been accused of murdering three doctors. Through the murder investigation, Discovery Crew interacts with Control, Starfleet's AI interface, which is housed at Section 31's headquarters. It is discovered that Control staged the footage of the murders that Spock is accused of using holographic footage, and is attempting to seize the data the Discovery obtained from the Dying Sphere. Control effectively now functions as the primary antagonist of the season, seizing control of Section 31 and operating its starships and even many of its humans like drones. The Red Angel is revealed to be Michael Burnham's mother, who had been working on time travel technology with Section 31 at the time the Klingons attacked their colony. She took an experimental time suit to attempt to warn of an attack, only to arrive over 900 years in the future, where she found that all sentient life in the universe had been destroyed by control. She revealed she's made over 840 time jumps in an attempt to stop control, but inadvertently led a future version of the evil AI back in time where it infected its own past self like a virus and began to seek out Discovery and the Sphere's data. Burnham realizes that the data on the Sphere is too powerful to allow control to gain access to it, and so she proposes a wild plan that they will use the time crystals and harness the technology of the Red Angel suit to send the Discovery into the future where Control cannot access it. Discovery has to go to the future. They create a copy of the Red Angel suit while the Discovery and Enterprise do battle with a fleet of Control-powered drone ships. Michael operates the suit, herself setting the five red signals that the ship has followed throughout the season, and a sixth for Discovery to follow her. After Control and its ships are destroyed, Michael and Discovery travel over 900 years into the future. The Enterprise purges itself of all systems that could be infected by an AI like Control ever again, and their crew reports Discovery was destroyed in battle. At Spock's suggestion, all references to Discovery and its crew are stricken from the records to prevent another Control-like incident and to explain to Star Trek fans why no other series has ever mentioned a Spore Drive or Spock's sister before. Months later, the Enterprise receives the seventh red signal, a message from Michael in the future that they arrive safely. And that's where we last left Discovery. What sort of universe will they find themselves in once the ship arrives in the future? We'll find out in Season 3 of Star Trek Discovery, only on CBS All Access starting October 15th.